popular author writes, on an overcast night, a ship was fighting rough seas as it approached the narrow entrance to a harbor. To the inexperienced passenger, the chances of finding and navigating the path to safety seemed remote at best. The slightest miscalculation could spell disaster. And yet the captain appeared calm and relaxed. A nervous passenger, perhaps seeking reassurance to settle his own fears, asked the captain, Sir, how do you know when to guide the ship into the harbor entrance? The captain pointed to the dark shoreline punctuated with random dots of light. Do you see those three brightest lights there on the land? The passenger searched for a moment and then nodded. I have learned, continued the captain, to steer my ship parallel to the shore until those three lights all line up. And when those three lights agree, then I know then I can guide my ship safely into the narrow entrance of the harbor. Most Christians today have been taught that this is the way believers are to find God's will. Whenever certain signs or markers line up, they believe then they will know the center of God's will. But is this what the Bible teaches? We are in the middle of a sermon series on God's will, and so far in our study, we have seen how important it is for us to know God's will. Ephesians 5.15 says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Colossians 1.9 says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God wants us to know his will. The question, though, is how do we know God's will? Where do we turn in order to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding? That's what we're trying to answer. <clears throat> and we're doing this very carefully and systematically because there are so many different ideas out there about how Christians are supposed to know the will of God. A couple of weeks ago, I think it's been three weeks ago now, we pointed out that there are about three main approaches to answering this question. There is what you might call the traditional view. There is the traditional charismatic view, which we didn't spend any time on, and I won't spend any time on. And then there is, of course, the wisdom view. And if you weren't here for that message, you may need to go back online and listen. And by the way, remember, when we talk about the traditional view, it's not traditional in the sense that it has always been the position of the church uh, down through church history. In fact, it really emerged in the last 100 years. It's really fairly recent. But it is traditional in the sense that it is currently the most widely held view. It has permeated the church. But for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the various ways the phrase will of God is used in Scripture. <clears throat> when the Bible talks about the will of God, <clears throat> it is not always referring to the same thing. <clears throat> 
And so far, we have seen that sometimes it refers to the sovereign will of God. We spend time on that. Sometimes it refers to those things that God has decreed to happen. And this aspect of God's will is certain and it will be accomplished by God's providence. Nothing can ever thwart God's sovereign will, but other than certain aspects of Bible prophecy in which God has told us in advance what he intends to do, we cannot know the sovereign will of God ahead of time. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. And the only way we can know the sovereign will of God is by looking back in our life and seeing what has already happened. If it has happened, then we can know it is part of God's sovereign will because nothing happens that is outside the sovereign will of God. Now, we, I quoted the first part of Deuteronomy 29, 29, but the, the second half of that verse says, the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. And that leads us to the second way the phrase will of God is used in the Bible, and that is to refer to the moral will of God. So we have the sovereign will of God, we have, secondly, the moral will of God. The moral will of God is the clear instruction that God has given to us in his word. This is the revealed will of God in contrast to the secret will. We can know this will because God has revealed it to us in his word. 100% of it is revealed in scripture. And this aspect of God's will is not certain. We may obey it or disobey God's word, but this is what God has told us in Scripture he wants us to do. And it is significant, I believe, that nowhere in the New Testament is a Christian ever commanded to find God's will. Instead, the emphasis is always on doing it. Not worrying about finding it, but doing it. Now, this assumes he has already told us what his will is. And in fact, he has done so in his word. We're not on a hunt, as John MacArthur points out. We're not seeking to discover God's will. God's will is not lost. It has been revealed to us in Scripture. So what we need to do is study what God's revealed and to apply it to our lives. And if we will be obedient to the things that God's Word is clear about, it will take care of about 99% of God's will for our lives. So the place we always need to begin in seeking God's will is to do what he has already made clear in his word. And as we saw last time, we know he wants us to be saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, suffering, sent, salt, and stewards. That was the last time we looked at those, the things that we can know are God's will. We can say those things for sure, along with really all the commands in Scripture and the precepts and principles that make up his moral will. But let's move on now tonight to a couple of other possible aspects of the use of God's will. And I say possible aspects because not all Bible scholars agree that there are any other aspects beyond the two that we've already discussed. Some want to limit it just to the sovereign will of God and the moral will of God. But I want to throw out two other possibilities 
to consider. And we're going to spend considerable time on the second one. But I want to first introduce one that R.C. Sproul called God's will of disposition. God's will of disposition. Sproul said, this aspect of God's will refers to what is pleasing and agreeable to God. He says, some things are well-pleasing in his sight, while other things are said to grieve him. He may allow wicked things to transpire, but he is by no means pleased with them. Now, an example of this is 2 Peter 3.9, where it says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. Now, if you try to put that in the category of the sovereign will of God, then you would have to say that everyone will be saved because the sovereign will of God cannot be thwarted, right? And yet we know from Scripture that not all will be saved. In other words, if you put this in that category of God's will, it will become a proof text for universalism, that everyone's going to be saved. On the other hand, many would say this is part of the moral will of God. But Sproul writes, this would mean that God does not allow people to perish in the sense that he grants his moral permission. In other words, it is not within his moral will to allow any to perish. So we have to rule out that category as well. So where does this fit? Doesn't seem to fit in either of those two. Sproul said there's a third option that is better, which is to see this as God's will of disposition. He says God is not willing in the sense that he is not inwardly disposed to or delighted by people's perishing. He says a human analogy may be seen in our law courts. A judge, in the interest of justice, may sentence a criminal to prison and at the same time inwardly grieve for the guilty man. His disposition may be for the man, but against the crime. MacArthur uses the term God's compassionate will. He says, this aspect of God's will refers to his heart's desire, which is within the scope of his comprehensive or sovereign will and completely consistent with it although it is more specific and focused. Unlike God's comprehensive will, however, his desires are not fulfilled. Do you see the problem here? This is why we might need a third category. In 1 Timothy 2.4, we read that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, right? And yet we know that's not going to happen. Many are going to follow the broad road that leads to destruction rather than the narrow way that leads to eternal life. Sproul brought this aspect of God's will into sharper focus when he wrote the distinction of God's revealed or moral will and his hidden or sovereign will raises a practical problem. The question of whether or not it is possible for a Christian to be acting in harmony with God's perceptive will and at the same time be working against his hidden will. Think about that for a moment. Is it possible for a Christian to be in harmony with God's moral will, his revealed will, his pre pre uh, percept preceptive will, 
and at the same time be working against God's sovereign will. Is that possible? Now, I'm going to ask you a trick question. Are you ready? You don't need to respond, but think about this. <clears throat> In Luke 22, 23, that's when our Lord is talking to Peter about his upcoming denial. Was it the Lord's will for Peter to deny Christ? Was it the Lord's will for Peter to deny Christ? Now, be careful. Which way are you going to answer? If you answer yes or no, you would not be entirely correct because what's the answer? The answer is both. It's both. Why? Well, certainly it's not God's moral will for Peter to deny Christ. I mean, that's a violation of what Jesus had revealed to him. But we have to say that it was, in fact, part of the sovereign will of God because nothing comes to pass that is not part of the sovereign will of God. But this really seems to fit best in this category of God's will of disposition. God allowed this to happen even though it grieved his heart when it occurred. Was it God's will? For Jesus to die on the cross? Yes and no. It was certainly not part of his moral will. It was essentially the putting to death of an innocent man. And yet it was certainly part of his sovereign will to provide the salvation of man. And that's what we see in that text we read just a few moments ago in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, 22, this is part of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, and he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, there's the sovereign will part, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. There's the responsibility part. There's the moral choice. Was not... God's moral will for them to do that, but it was God's sovereign will for them to do that for the sake of our salvation. Sproul wrote, when Pontius Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified, Pilate acted against the preceptive will of God, but in harmony with the decretive will of God. And he's using different terms so I can reword it this way. Pontius Pilate, when he delivered Jesus up to be crucified, acted against the moral will of God, but he acted in harmony with the sovereign will of God. And so Sproul asked, does this make nonsense of God's moral will? God forbid. What it does is to bear witness to the transcendent power of God to work his purposes sovereignly in spite of and by means of the evil acts of men. And we could say the very same thing about the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Do you remember what Joseph said to his brothers when they finally knew who he was. You remember what he said? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, right? In other words, God can take even those things which are done by men with evil intentions and bring about his purposes from them. But the point is, 
that these kinds of things don't seem to fit neatly into either of the other two categories of God's will. In a sense, we could call this the permissive will of God because it reflects what he permits or allows. It certainly, I think, comes under the umbrella of his sovereign will, but it may be a special subcategory of that. But I want to move on now to another possible category, and that is the individual will of God, the individual will of God. Almost all Bible scholars agree on the first two, that there are references to the sovereign will of God and references to the moral will of God. But the traditional view says there is also what is referred to as the individual will of God. And that's where I want us to spend the rest of our time this evening. Does God have an individual will for each and every one of us? And if so, how detailed is it and how do we find it? Is there a blueprint for each individual Christian? Is that what the Bible teaches? And if there is a blueprint or a dot, a center of God's will, like the bullseye on a target, then how do we know what that blueprint is? And what happens if we miss the bullseye? What happens? Now, you might say, Pastor, why is this so important for us to take time on Sunday evening to talk about it? Well, I believe this is very important because there are thousands, if not millions of Christians expending tons of time and energy trying to find God's dot for their lives, and most are completely frustrated with the entire process. Many Christians are living in frustration, believing that they have missed God's best and are having to settle now for second or third best. Others are turning to all kinds of mystical methods to try to hear God and find his dot for their lives, the center of God's will. And quite frankly, folks, many of these methods are highly suspect at best and downright dangerous at worst. And we're going to go through those faulty methods one by one. There are 13 of them. But let's go back now and examine more carefully this whole idea of the individual will of God. You say, Pastor, do you believe in an individual will of God for every believer? Well, let me just give you a firm answer. It depends. It depends. Here's what I mean. If you mean by that God has a blueprint for each of us and how he wants our lives to go, and we're supposed to try to find this dot, the bullseye, the center of his will, then no, I do not believe that is what is taught in Scripture. If, however, you mean by that, that God cares for each of us individually and is at work providentially in our lives, accomplishing his divine purposes in and through us every single day, then yes, absolutely, I believe that. James Petty writes, although God does have an individual and specific will for every Christian, this plan is strictly secret. God does not normally reveal anything about it to us. He goes to great lengths to tell of its existence and its power, but we are never led to expect to know it. It is information that, for now at least, is for God's use alone. This is part of his secret will. 
And then he says this, he says, in the wisdom view, <clears throat> divine guidance has nothing to do with discerning this secret plan and using it to make decisions. Guidance is given by God when he gives us insight into issues and choices so that we make the decisions with divinely inspired wisdom. That's the wisdom view. Now, those who hold to the traditional view would say that the moral will of God does not cover every issue that we face in life. And in specific situations that we have to make decisions about. And so since the Bible doesn't address everything, we have to be guided by God's individual will. And by the way, <clears throat> I believe the reason that people often say that is because they really do not understand the tremendous implications of the moral will of God and all the relevance that it has for our daily decision-making. There is more to the broadness of the application of Scripture than most Christians realize. And although the Bible does not directly address every single issue we face, there are biblical principles that apply to every aspect of life. And even though we might not be able to go to a direct command, we can go to a principle that gives us aid in making godly decisions. Now, I was just getting on my preaching on there, but we'll come back to that later. How do we define the individual will of God? Friesen says that those who hold the traditional view would define the individual will of God as, quote, that ideal, detailed life plan that God has uniquely designed for each believer, end quote. For example, let's say that you are a single person and you are looking for a mate. And you know that the Bible <clears throat> tells you that it is not God's will <clears throat> for you to marry an unbeliever. That's 2 Corinthians 6, 14. But beyond that, you want to know which Christian girl God would want you to marry. And since God's moral will, the Bible, does not give you that kind of specific guidance, you seek God's individual will for your life in this matter. And you may agonize over this decision for a long time, trying to find the center of God's will. Because you know if you miss it and you get the wrong one, then you might have to settle for less than God's best. And those who hold to the traditional view would say that this guidance is given through the indwelling Holy Spirit who progressively reveals God's life plan to the heart of the individual believer. And the Spirit uses many means to reveal this life plan, but he always gives confirmation at the point of each decision. Does he? Is that how we discern God's will? Henry Blackaby writes, whenever God gets ready to do something, he always reveals to a person or his people what he is going to do. Does he? Does he really? Those who hold to the traditional view say yes. But is this what the Bible teaches? Where in Scripture is that taught? And we're going to deal with this very carefully, and we're going to come back to this one as well. So, uh, you know, don't, don't get all anxious. We're going to cover all these things as we go along. But those who hold to the traditional view believe that the Bible supports the individual will of God in the sense that God has a specific blueprint for each and every believer and that we can know what that blueprint is. Gary Friesen writes, the proof for the existence 
of God's individual will comes from four sources. It's the argument that's made. It comes from four sources. It comes from reason, from experience, from biblical example, and from biblical teaching. It comes from those four. Let's look at those four very quickly, and I'm, I'm not gonna get very far into these tonight, but I wanna at least introduce them. Some would say that the concept of an individual will as defined by the traditional view, is reasonable because God is a God of order. Some would say it is only reasonable to conclude that God would use his ability to formulate an ideal life plan for each of his children. It's reasonable for that to be the case. And by the way, let me just reiterate, because I don't want anyone to misunderstand, that I am not denying that there is an individual will for each of our lives planned by God. All I'm saying is that that is a part of God's sovereign will, and we can't know God's sovereign will in advance. But Friesen writes this. He says, the images in the Bible to portray God and his relationship to believers argue strongly for the reasonableness of the individual will of God. God is our king, our shepherd, and our father. What great king has no plan for his people? What wise shepherd has no plan by which to guide his sheep? What loving father has no design for his son, right? And I think it is important to talk about this because people always bring up verses that picture God as king, shepherd, and father. And we're gonna come back to this as well. Not only then is there an appeal to reason that this is reasonable that God would do this, but there's also an appeal to experience. People give testimonies of how they knew God was guiding them in a certain way. And by the way, people are very passionate about this. I've spoken on this subject at other churches and I got uh, some pretty strong re response from some people who they had their experience. How could I deny their experience? Saints in every age have testified that the Holy Spirit is our personal indwelling guide. We're gonna come back to this one as well. And then we have the evidence from Scripture, right? This evidence takes two forms. First, there's the evidence of biblical examples of those in Scripture that were guided in some special individual way. Some of the biblical examples in the New Testament would include Jesus himself, the Apostle Paul, who was specifically led to Macedonia, the evangelist Philip, who was directed to the Ethiopian eunuch, Peter, who was directed to Cornelius, Ananias, who was led to Paul, and the Holy Spirit showing the Jerusalem council what to do about the Gentiles who were becoming believers. These are given as examples, biblical examples. In the Old Testament, we have the examples of Moses, Joshua, David, Elijah, Josiah, Ruth, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, to name a few. Let me just respond quickly tonight to these three aspects before we get to the specific passages that defend this view. What about the argument from reason? This argument hinges on two of God's attributes, his orderliness and his omniscience. Now certainly with these attributes, we must conclude that God could in fact develop a blueprint for each individual believer in the sense of the dots. But do these attributes require 
God to do so. For example, one author writes, consider this illustration. He says, it is reasonable to think that a man might drive his car down Main Street on his way to work because that is the shortest route to his place of business. It's reasonable. But does he have to go that way? He may, in fact, take a longer route, which because of a lower volume of traffic and fewer signal lights allows him to get there even more quickly. Reason permits either alternative. The orderliness of God and his omniscience does not necessitate an individual will of God in the sense that the traditional view understands it. God could just as reasonably guide our lives through his moral will as revealed in Scripture, along with, of course, his providence. So there is another alternative that is also reasonable. What about the idea that a king, shepherd, or father would have a detailed plan for his subjects, sheep, or children? The question I would have here is, does that really happen? I mean, let me just ask those of you who are parents. Is every last detail of your child's life planned out for them? I don't think so. I don't think so. A wise father teaches his children the principles that he or she needs to guide his or her life and make wise decisions, but he doesn't do every last thing for the child and make every decision for them, especially as he matures. And by the way, if you do that, you will ruin your child's. You will cripple them. How many kings or presidents plan every last detail for every last one of their subjects? That doesn't happen, does it? Of course, he may have a general direction he provides, but he doesn't seek to legislate every move of every single person under his authority. And a shepherd sets boundaries for the sheep, but he doesn't tell each sheep which blades of grass to eat. In the same way, God gives us guidance, but it is not the kind of guidance that is often thought of. Friesen writes, God is indeed a guide, but his means of guidance may be different from that suggested by the traditional view. It may be more general than specific. It may give increasing freedom and responsibility to believers in their decision-making. He says, God does guide his people like a father, a shepherd, and a king. These figures do not, however, argue for the existence of an individual will of God in the way the traditional view portrays it. In fact... They support the idea that God guides through the basic principles of life he has given to us in the Bible. His moral will, thereby teaching his children to wisely use their freedom in the application of these principles to the decisions of life. Now you say, what about (coughs) the experiences of those in church history that seem to have received individual guidance from God concerning specific issues. I mean, what about guys like Hudson Taylor? The traditional view would say the reason for Hudson Taylor's success as a missionary in China can be attributed to the fact that he followed God's individual will for his life in going to China. But how do we know that's true? Is it not possible that Hudson Taylor could have been just as successful as a missionary in India 
Or perhaps he could have even been more successful in India than he was in China. We don't know that, right? Because he didn't go to India, he went to China. Or we could also say that Hudson Taylor's accomplishments in China stem not from his obedience to an individual will, but to God's moral will. That Hudson Taylor was merely being obedient to the mandate of God's word to go and make disciples of all the nations. Isn't that what Joshua 1, 7 and 8 is all about? Turn with me to Joshua 1 and we'll close with this tonight. Joshua 1. And look with me at verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Be very careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have, what is that? Success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. The Bible says success comes from knowing and doing God's revealed will. As Hudson Taylor was obedient to the Great Commission, God blessed his work, and he had success as a missionary. And again, it is a very dangerous thing to base your theology on experience. It must be based on Scripture. Well, we're out of time for tonight, so we'll have to pick it up here next time. And I realize I'm really kind of right in the middle of this, so hang on to your questions. We'll get to all of this as we can. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight that your word gives us instruction. We thank you that you have given us all we need for life and godliness. And Lord, we pray you to help us to live for you this week and to follow the principles of your word. Help us to make wise decisions and that we might honor you with every one of those. So Lord, help us in that this week. In Jesus' name, amen.